All right, so here we are. This is the third lecture we're doing on Heidegger's essay, The Origin of the Work of Art, for my uh, philosophy and the arts course at University of Houston. La last lecture, we covered these three interpretations, these, um, these traditional interpretations of uh, the thing, okay? And so let's, let's go ahead and we're going to recap these, these three conceptions interpretations of the thing <clears throat> and it's talking a little bit about the shortcomings but in this video we're going to focus uh, on the equipment a little bit more a little bit more on, on equipment we talked about that last lecture uh, talking about uh, equipment the nature of equipment and believe it or not pretty quick we'll be jumping into art and if we have time by the end of the video we'll be getting into the relationship between art and truth. And that will probably most of it, if even if we touch on it, this video, it'll be barely touching on it. Most of that stuff about truth will have to be fleshed out in the fourth lecture uh, of the series, okay? So again, let's recap where we've been so far, the story so far, these uh, three interpretations of the thing. Remember the first one he mentions is, is as if the thing is a bearer of traits, you know, it's substance with accidents, um, you know, and, and this is reflected, this sort of understanding of the thing is reflected in the way that we construct our language, namely the, um, our sentence structure, the object, sorry, the subject, predicate, sentence structure. The problem with this for Heidegger is it's too general, right? Uh, for him, there are certain beings uh, that exist, which we hesitate to call a thing. You know, for him, he's going to uh, distinguish between just mere things, uh, pieces of equipment, and, and, and what he calls works. And, and so, you know, for instance, we wouldn't want to call a human just, just a thing. And so this first interpretation fails because it doesn't really distinguish that, right? You can, you can add predicates. You, you talk about God, for instance, in a sentence, even though you, you might not want to be, refer to God as just a, a mere thing. So that doesn't get to the thingliness of, of a thing. The second interpretation, again, this is the unity of sensory manifold. This is sort of the Kant, Kantian approach, if you're familiar with Immanuel Kant. Um, the thing is just something that we take from our experience, all these you know, infinite inputs of senses and emotions and all the things that, we, that we're aware of uh, in this sort of direct immediate level are, are kind of organized into some sort of thing we understand. The problem with that is it's too abstract for Heidegger. We don't usually experience things uh, as the sum total or the organization of the totality of our experience, you know, the unity of all of our senses, but things jump out at us, right? The siren as it, as it drives by just juts out and the, the door slamming. This is not just a sort of result of calculation and, 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 and a sort of detached kind of uh, uh, engagement with the world that, that eventually becomes attached through its interpretation. Um, the thing is something that just, like, again, jumps out at us. And the third interpretation, thing as formed matter. This is sort of the Aristotelian uh, definition. Matter and form are inseparable. Form is just what matter does or, 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 or what matter um, is affected as. And for him, for Heidegger, this is actually a really uh, good interpretation when we're talking about what he calls equipment, okay? And so it gets at the sort of structure of equipment um, in a kind of crude way. We talked about that towards the end of the last video. But just like the first interpretation, it's too broad, and it doesn't distinguish between a mere thing and to work, but maybe equipment is not a bad place to start because, as Heidegger pointed out earlier in the essay, the this notion of equipment seems to be a middle in the middle, right? It's in this intermediate ground between what we consider just a mere thing and a work, you know, like for instance, a work of art or something higher, like a like the like God or a human being. So let's read this quote here, and this is a bit of a sort of a, recap. In the course of the history of truth about beings, 
The interpretations mentioned have also entered into combinations, a matter we may now pass over. In such combinations, they further strengthen their innate tendency to expand so as to apply in similar way to thing, to equipment, and to work. So again, they become broadened and broadened. So they're so general that we don't distinguish between things that for Heidegger are distinct, namely a thing, a piece of equipment, and a work. <clears throat> so thus they give rise to a mode of thought by which we think not only about thing, equipment, and work, but about all beings in general. This long familiar mode of thought preconceives all immediate experience of beings. So this way of thinking, which you know for Heidegger really or, or originates in Western thought, has become intuitive. It's become second nature to us. And so that, that our, our, our experience is almost preconceived in these terms. And why is this, right? Why is this? Maybe it's not completely philosophy's, Western philosophy's fault. Maybe it's not completely intellectuals that we have to blame for this. He wants us to, again, figure out the thingliness of the thing, but since equipment is, falls in between thingness and work, workliness and whatever you want to call it, um, he wants to uncover what he calls the equipmentality of equipment what makes equipment equipment and he thinks that that's going to illuminate the thingness of the thing and the workly character of the work because again equipment somewhere in the middle so in order to do this in order to um to do this he has to keep at a distance from any and all preconceptions and assault of these the first three interpretations right remember of of being as a thing with or the thing as a bearer of traits the thing as a unity of sensory manifold and the thing as form matter, right? He wants to avoid all those shortcomings. <clears throat> he asks, is it an accident that the interpretation of the thing, the view that takes matter and form as guide, attains to special dominance? This definition of the thing derives from an interpretation of the equipmental being of equipment. So in other words, he does think this. He thinks that, again, it's, it's not an accident that we interpret the thing this way, that this view uh, has a certain dominance, that it, that it sort of dominates our thinking, whether we're philosophers or not. We engage with the world in this way. Um, so he says this definition derives its interpretation from what he calls the equipmental being of equipment. What is it about equipment that makes it equipment? And equipment, having come into being through human making, is particularly familiar to human thinking. At the same time, this familiar being has a peculiar intermediate position between thing and work. We shall follow this clue and search for, sorry, search first for the equipmental character of equipment. Right. So just like I said, he's going to look for the equipmental character of equipment and use this maybe as a clue to get at the thingness of the thing and the work, the workly character of the work. So how is he gonna do this? Again, I told you we get to art a lot quicker than you think we would. Here we are already talking about art, even though uh, it's very indirect and inadvertently, he's using this painting by Van Gogh um, in order to uncover what he calls the equipmentality, you know, the equipmental aspect of equipment. So let's read, how does he do this? We choose as example, a common sort of equipment, a pair of peasant shoes. We do not need to exhibit actual pieces of this sort of useful article in order to describe them. Everyone is acquainted with them. But since it is a matter here of direct description, it may well be well to facilitate the visual realization of them. For this purpose, a pictorial representation suffices. We shall choose a well-known painting by Van Gogh, who painted several such shoes, or sorry, who painted such shoes several times. But what is there to see here? Everyone knows what shoes consist of. If they're not wooden or bast shoes, they're There'll be leather soles, uppers, joined together by thread and nails. 
Such gear serves to clothe the feet. Depending on the use to which the shoes are to be put, whether for work in the field or for dancing, matter and form will differ, right? So if it's a ballerina shoes, you're gonna make it with different material and it'll have a different shape than like the, sh the shoes we have here in the Van Gogh painting, the peasant's shoes, as Heidegger puts it. So such statements are no doubt correct, but they only explicate what we already know. The equipmental quality of equipment consists in its usefulness. But what about the usefulness itself? Okay, so he thinks that what makes equipment equipment is that you can use it for something, right? But what is usefulness? What does that mean? In conceiving it, do we already conceive along with it the equipmental character of equipment? In order to succeed in doing this, must we not look out for useful equipment in its use? The peasant woman wears her shoes in the field. Only here are they what they are. They are all the more genuinely so, the less the peasant thinks about the shoes while she is at work, or looks at them at all, or is even aware of them. She stands and walks in them. That is how shoes actually serve. It is in the process of the use of equipment that we must actually encounter the character of equipment. Okay, so for Heidegger, the equipmentality, as he puts it, of equipment, most authentically, most directly confronts it in the actual use of this equipment, right? As he puts it in this quote, right? Um, she wears her shoes, right? Only here are they what they are. He says something similar in one of his other uh, essays, uh, the, uh, what is it, Introduction to Metaphysics, I think. He talks about how a schoolhouse, the school is not really a school by just sitting there. It's not truly a school until there are students in it, learning and teachers teaching and chalk, making noise on chalkboards. I guess that's kind of an outdated example, the chalk part at least. But for him, that's where they truly have their being. So the peasant's shoes truly have their being in being used, at least that because they're a piece of equipment and they get their piece of their, their equipmentality and their use, it is in this sort of engagement with them. And when I engage with them, when I'm actually using them in that sense, I lose sight of them. He talks about the hammer in um, being in time. You know, when the, when the, the carpenter the builder is using his hammer and he's hammering down. He is the hammer, right? There's no separation between himself and the instrument. He loses himself in it, right? And, and for Heidegger, this is the essence of the hammer. This is when the equipmentality of the equipment uh, comes to the fore, right? And, and, and by sort of receding and not being obvious, the less the, the peasant looks at it, the less she even notices the shoes, the more they are truly shoes, right? The more they do what their function is to do, right? To, to be comfortable and, and workable. As long as we only imagine a pair of shoes in general, or simply look at the empty unused shoes as they merely stand there in the picture, we shall never discover what the equipmental being of the equipment in truth is. From Van Gogh's painting, we cannot even tell where these shoes stand. There's nothing surrounding this pair of peasant shoes in or to which they might belong, only an undefined space. There are not even clods of soil from the field or the field path sticking to them, which would at least hint at their use. A pair of peasant shoes and nothing more. And yet, from the dark opening of the worn insides of the shoes, the toilsome tread of the worker stares forth. In the stiffly rugged heaviness of the shoes, there is the accumulated tenacity of her slow trudge through the far spreading and ever uniform furrows of the field swept by a raw wind. In the leather lie the dampness and the richness of the soil. 
Under the soul slide the loneliness of the field path as evening falls. In the shoes vibrates the silent call of the earth, its quiet gift of the ripening grain, and its unexplained self-refusal in the fallow desolation of the wintry field. This equipment is pervaded by uncomplaining anxiety as to the certainty of bread, the wordless joy of having once more withstood want, and trembling before the impending childbed and shivering at the surrounding menace of death. This equipment belongs to the earth and it is protected in the world of the peasant woman. From out of this protected belonging, the equipment itself rises to its resting within itself. So if we, if we allow this painting of Van Gogh to affect us in this way, it doesn't just represent a, p a pair of shoes for us, right? It evokes all of these images. It evokes all of this that comes with the, the totality, the world within which the peasant shoes must exist. But perhaps it is only the picture that we notice, sorry, <clears throat> but perhaps it is only in the picture that we notice all this about the shoes. The peasant woman, on the other hand, simply wears them. If only this simply wearing were so simple. When she takes off her shoes late in the evening, in deep but healthy fatigue, and reaches out for them again in the still dim dawn, or passes them by on the day of rest, she knows all this without noticing or reflecting. The equipmental quality of the equipment consists indeed in its usefulness, but this usefulness itself rests in the abundance of an essential being of the equipment. We call it reliability. By virtue of this reliability, the peasant woman is made privy to the silent call of the earth. By virtue of the reliability of the equipment, she is sure of her world. Right? A, lot, a lot to unpack here. I don't think in this video, I'm not going to get into uh, Heidegger's concept of earth and world because he's going to elaborate it on it much further later on in the essay. So we'll hold off a little bit on that, but I feel like I have to at least drop a few hints here to make this a little bit more clear what's going on in this quote. Right, again, we're talking about equipment and we're reflecting on the equipmental character, what makes equipment equipment. It's use, it's, it's, it's usefulness, right? But what is its usefulness? Its usefulness is really for him, as he's putting here, reliability. And in this reliability, we sort of lose sight of it, right? <clears throat> we know it's there, but we don't reflect on it, right? Should we, we know it without noticing or reflecting, as he puts it, right? As, as the woman, you know, she, she takes the shoes off at the end of the day after she's been working in the field all day, and she doesn't think about it. She knows she's taking her shoes off. If you asked her, hey, what are you doing? Taking my shoes off, idiot, can't you see? She's aware of it, but she's not reflecting on it. it it's just a part of her sort of... Um, you know, just the way she's composed, her comportment with the world, <clears throat> it's sort of an auto, she's sort of on autopilot, right? This is sort of like a, just an automatic response, right? When she, whether she's taking her shoes off at the end of the day, whether she's putting them on in the morning in the, the still dim dawn, or whether she passes them by, uh, you know, she's not going to wear them today because she's going to church. So she's got her fancy dress shoes on. She knows they're there without noticing or reflecting. Just like, you know, if you're watching this video, maybe you're watching this video while you're sitting down. You're aware that you're sitting down. You know that you're sitting down on a chair, but you're not thinking about the chair. Well, maybe now you are, now that I pointed it out to you, but you're sure of it, right? You, you know, the reliability of, equip, of, of the equipment is by virtue of that, that you are sure of your world, okay? <clears throat> and so, again, more about what he means by world, what, more of what he means by uh, earth later. We're, we're going to hold off for that until um, uh, probably the next video. So, again, the usefulness of equipment, he thinks, is a necessary component of its reliability. Um, 
sorry, not component, consequent of its reliability. That was a complete mistake. A consequent of its reliability. Because the shoes are reliable, they're seen as useful, not the other way around, okay? Because they work, because they, are, we, because they work so effectively that we even lose sight of them, um, and they, they, they create such a good workflow, that's why the, this term usefulness, that's why this conception of usefulness is even possible. Right? He says, the former vibrates in the latter and would be nothing without it. So he, he still hasn't uncovered to his satisfaction what a thing is, right? What is the thingly character of things or the workly character of work, right? We're still dealing with equipment here, right? He says this repose of equipment resting within itself consists in its reliability, right? Only with this reliability do we discern what the equipment in truth is. So he's, he's satisfied with his analysis of equipment. But then he says, we still know nothing of what we first sought, the thing's thingly character. We know nothing at all of what we really and solely seek, the workly character of the work in the sense of the work of art, right? The title of this essay, Origin of Work of Art. When are we going to get to talking about art as, as a work, right? He's already sort of started on this, though, indirectly right? How do we get to the equipmental being of equipment? Well, we did it in this case by reflecting on a work of art, Van Gogh's painting. At least that's how Heidegger got to it. Looking at this work of art, kind of reflecting on it, thinking about what's represented in it, thinking about the world of the peasant woman and what makes these shoes so worn, right? This sort of allowed us to understand what it means to be a piece of equipment. So as he puts it, the equipmental quality of equipment was discovered, but how? Not by a description and explanation of a pair of shoes actually present, not by a report about the process of making shoes, and also not by the observation of the actual use of shoes occurring here and there, but only by bringing ourselves before Van Gogh's painting. This painting spoke. In the vicinity of the work, we were suddenly somewhere else than we usually tend to be. So according to Heidegger, he's going to say that the artwork, in truth, let us know what shoes truly are. Just like, again, the school is only truly a school when the students are there learning and the teachers are teaching and the, and the shoes are not truly shoes. And, uh, uh, work shoes unless someone's working in them we weren't able to experience that what shoes truly are the way the peasant woman did unless we reflected on them through this work of art so the artwork as he says let us know what shoes are in truth it would be the worst self-deception to think that our description as a subjective action had first depicted everything thus and then projected it into the painting. If anything is questionable here, it is rather that we experience too little in the neighborhood of the work, and that we express the experience too crudely and too literally. So he's saying, you know, it's not that, you know, we're not looking for something here. This is what arose out of our experience of the painting. You might have got something different. Maybe to you, the shoes just look like boots that you used to wear, right? But they remind you of, you know, how faithful and if, if it works as a work it's going to transport you into sort of you know in this case we're talking about shoes but the truth of what is being put forth in the work right the you know the, the truth of them right in this case the equipment out the equipmental nature of equipment and the, the particular equipment here we're talking about the peasant shoes and for him it's you know it's not this uh, as he puts it um Proje projection we're not projecting our own sort of preconceptions in it, it at least if we're if we're allowing the work to do its work um in fact the the opposite should be said that we that we we did injustice to it this is a a kind of a crude description of what it really would be like if we were actually standing in front of the van gogh painting and we were really imagining the the world of the peasant through through this the work that we're looking at now, these shoes, right? You know, he's trying to get at it through his description, but as he puts it, he says, the way we express the experience is too crude and too literal. Above all, the work did not 
as it might seem at first, serve merely for a better visualizing of what a piece of equipment is. Rather, the equipmentality of equipment first genuinely arrives at its appearance through the work and only in the work. So it can only appear in the work when the equipment is actually working, like when the peasant woman is wearing the shoes and actually, you know, working the field, the, the shoes don't appear. If they appear, then they're not actually doing their job. They're too obstructive. They're annoying. They're uncomfortable. They're getting in the way of her doing her job. It's only in a work of art that I can experience this as an appearance and not lose that equipmental character of equipment. What happens here? Heidegger asks. What is at work in the work? Van Gogh's painting is the disclosure of what the equipment, the pair, the peasant shoes, is in truth. This entity emerges into the unconcealedness of its being. Very mysterious phrase there. We're going to have to kind of wait till later lecture to get at a full explanation of what he means by unconcealedness. But he's deriving this from the word aletheia, from the Greeks, right? So the Greeks called unconcealedness of beings aletheia. We say truth and think little enough in using this word. So again, truth is one way you, you, you can um, translate that word, aletheia. If there occurs in the work a disclosure, and you know, unconcealing this, if there occurs in the work a disclosure of a particular being, disclosing what and how it is, then there is here an occurring, a happening of truth at work. So, so he sees this, this work by Van Gogh if it has this effect on us the way it does in this passage to him, if it evokes this response, it is a happening of truth at work. So Heider's going to argue that the essential nature of art, what makes it art, right? What is it that we add to this thing that makes it not just a mere thing, but art is exactly this setting itself to work, as he puts it, of the truth of beings. Okay. It's a happening of truth at work, right? And again, truth is understood here, and we'll get, we'll get into the details of this in the next lecture. We'll have to, to sort of unpack this a lot more, but truth is understood as aletheia, that, that Greek word, unconcealed, unconcealment, right? Disclosedness. Okay. So the work allows, as he puts it, the opening up of beings in their being, right? It opens up beings, in this case we're talking about peasant shoes, this being, this thing, in its being, in its proper place, as this, as this tool that's used by the peasant woman. So again, the work allows this to happen. It allows the opening of beings in their being, and in this, in this sense, it's a happening of truth. In the work of art, the truth of an entity has set itself to work. To set means here to bring to a stand. To, to, for some particular entity, a, a pair of peasant shoes, for instance, comes in the work to stand in the light of its being. The being of the being, right, that what, what makes the peasant shoes, peasant shoes, comes into the steadiness of its shining. Okay, it shines forth, it strikes us. We walk by the painting, we look at it, we're like, oh, it's just some peasant shoe. Oh, wow, look at their worn and dirty and old. Man, I bet the person who wore them is some woman who works the fields. So imagine the toil and trouble. The being of the being comes into the steadiness of its shining. The nature of art would be this then. The truth of beings setting itself to work. But until now, art presumably has had to do with the beautiful and beauty and not with truth. Okay, so Heider wants to explain, you know, how is it that this has come about? Now, we're going to have to save the majority of this for the next video. But let's, let's read this in the next 
<clears throat> slide, couple slides here to get us a good head start on this conception of truth as alathia, right? As uncovering and unconcealment, disclosedness. He, he opposes this conception of art as representational, right? And in that sense, it's always going to fail as something true. Art will never ad adequately represent some other thing, right? You know, we're looking at like a portrait painting or something like that. What does he take to be truth then if not representational truth? So he writes, agreement with what is has long been taken to be the essence of truth. It's, you know, what you might call, some philosophers call this correspondence theory of truth, right? You know, you say something true, it corresponds to something that is, okay? So agreement with what is has long been taken to be the essence of truth. But then is it our opinion that this painting by Van Gogh depicts a pair of shoes actually existing? Right, an actually existing pair of peasant shoes, or is a work of, or is it a work of art because it does so successfully? Right, this is sort of like the uh, Plato approach to good art. Art is good if it copies the form properly. It's a successful copy. Is it our opinion that the painting draws a likeness from something actual and transposes it into a product of artistic production? By no means. Okay, so that's not what Heidegger's saying. Art is not a perfect mirror or a perfect representation of something actual. That's not the point, right? The, the work, therefore, is not the reproduction of some particular entity that happens to be present at any given time. It is, on the contrary, the reproduction of the thing's general essence. Let's not be confused here, though, with this, what he means by the thing's general essence. This makes him sound a bit like Schopenhauer. Like a work of art is a representation of the platonic idea, right? You know, the, the, the painting by Delacroix of the lion is what the lion is trying to be, but, but fails to be the perfect lion, the perfect, most fiercest lion in itself, right? The platonic ideal. That's not what Heidegger's saying, right? Remember, the, 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 these peasant shoes are not perfect shoes, but they are what they are when they're being used to work as equipment. And the painting let us see that. Right, so that's what he means by a reproduction of the thing's general essence, not some platonic essence. Right, but then where and how is this general essence? Where is it? Right, how is it? Where is it? So that artworks are able to agree with it. Right, what is the relationship? If it's not this representational relationship or this relationship of correspondence, what is the nature of this relationship? With what nature of what thing? For instance, should a Greek temple agree? Now, who could maintain the impossible view that the idea of temple is represented in the building? And yet, truth is set to work in such a work if it is a work. Okay. So he's going to look at this poem here by uh, C.F. Meyer, The Roman Fountain. He's going to give the example of the actual Greek temple later on in the essay. But we've already covered way too much material, I think, and we're running over time. So I'm going to go ahead and stop here on the video, and we're going to pick it up where we left off. The next video will be focused mainly on this conception of truth as unconcealment, and that's a bit of a digression from focusing on art. But it's going to pay off in the end once we get to the fourth, fifth, sixth video. I think it'll be six or seven videos in this series all will finally pay off in the end and we'll start talking about world and earth and all of these sort of things and how those uh the interplay between those two forces uh are what make the art work and do what it does uh but again that's an, that's uh, something for another time i'm gonna go take a quick breather here uh you should too thanks for sticking around to the end of this video and i hope to see you on the other side